an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She rises while it is yet night and she provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it with the fruits of her hands. She plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she laughs at the time to come. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also. And he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. You are strong, you are brave, you are beautiful, you are wonderful. Happy Mother's Day, you are my hero.
Welcome to Fishhawk Fellowship Church. We believe that each and every person is deeply loved by our great God. We exist in this community to share that love with everyone around us. God has uniquely equipped this family to reach outside of our walls and serve those in need physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We believe that no matter what the circumstances, our God is ready and able to use us to change lives, bring hope, and push back the darkness. We do this through connecting in love with people regardless of where they are. Our ultimate mission is to use what God has given us to build bridges of gospel-driven hope that connect people of all ages and all walks of life to a passionate life in Christ. So I want to preface everything that I'm about to share with you with this. I, I love my wife. Like, I really love her. We're doing great. Marriage is awesome. I believe she's one of the, yeah, no, she's the best human I've ever met. Uh, but as I was preparing for this message, uh, this message just reminded me of one of her lesser flaws. Now, we all have flaws, every single one of us, even my near perfect wife. And, uh, you know, as I was preparing for this, this message, I, I was reminded of the fact that my wife, she hates getting gas. She absolutely hates going to the gas station and filling up her tank. Do you know what that's like? If, if you do, go ahead and write in your comments below, hey, that's totally me. I hate the gas station. I hate filling up the tank. You can go ahead and write that in. Let us know if that's you uh, so I can avoid riding in the car with you because you're likely on E right now. So my wife, she, she, she hates getting gas like many of you and filling up her tank. And just to give you a frame of reference, there's a fuel gauge on every single car. I want to bring notice to this. And there's a big F that says full, and there's a big E that means empty. And there's even now in the technology of our cars today, there's a light that will come on. And there's even like you'll hear dings in your car to let you know that it's time to get filled up. But for my wife, she senses when she sees that light and when she, she hears the ding, she's actually encouraged by it. She gets strength from it. She's like, oh, that means I have at least 30 miles left. And so oftentimes what happens is she's not just on E, but she's way below E. She tests this fuel gauge out every single week. And so over the past 12 years of getting to love my wife and, and getting to have this great relationship with her. Over the past 12 years, she has uh, run out of gas in really inconvenient spots around 10 times. I mean, one time, I totally get it. I get it. Two times, okay, maybe you should practice a, a little more uh, uh, safety and caution. But 10 times, now you're just being reckless. You know what I'm saying? And it's oftentimes the worst possible situations. She'll get stuck uh, in the middle of a, a busy highway in the middle of rush hour. She'll, uh, she'll get stuck on her way to an important event or a wedding. Uh, she's even gotten stuck in a Starbucks drive through I mean, she finds really creative ways to run out of gas. You know, over the past 11 or so years that I've been in ministry, what I've learned is that cars aren't the only things that have gas tanks. Cars aren't the only things that have gas tanks. People have them too. I have a gas tank. You have a gas tank. Everyone listening to this, we have gas tanks. Some of you right now, your tank is full. You're full of life, you're full of strength, full of energy, full of hope, full of joy and peace. You're full of faith, you're full. But if there's others that are honest listening to this message, you'd identify yourself as running on empty. You're burned out, stressed out, demotivated, discouraged. Maybe you're drinking too much. Maybe you're looking at things you shouldn't look at, overwhelmed by the stuff of life. Maybe you're eating poorly, binging shows that uh, make no sense. 
Maybe right now on this Mother's Day, you're trying to figure out what it's like to be a mom and a teacher and a great wife and a great follower of Jesus, trying to be everything to everyone and you're exhausted. Maybe uh, you're the provider of the home and you're looking into the distance, thinking about what it's gonna be like to be furloughed or let go and you're overwhelmed with the situation that you're in. Maybe it's in your marriage. You're spending more and more time together in your home and for whatever reason, you're not clicking. You feel like you're burning uh, up the last bit of fuel you've got running on empty, low on hope. And if that's where you might be today, I'm really glad that you're here to listen to this message. There's a question that came in just a few weeks ago as we started this Asking for a Friend uh, series. And the question is this, what do you do when you feel like you're running on empty? I mean, how do you get from off of E back to full? How do you, if you're low on hope, if you're low on faith, if you're low on on joy and peace and patience, how do you find a way to fill back up? So glad you're here because we're gonna go back into a story in the Old Testament and learn about the life of Elijah where we find him in this exact spot. He once was high on a mountaintop and then we find him burned up, running on empty, overwhelmed, ready to give up and die. But the cool part of the story is that God was able to fill his tank and send him back with more hope and refueled, replenished, restored. And I believe the same invitation is available to us today. So to catch you up on the story of Elijah's life up to this point. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah is a prophet of God. And during this time in Israel, there were other prophets that were, uh, that they're worshiping false gods. And so uh, in 1 Kings 18, what you'll read is that Elijah, the prophet of the one true God decides, I am so done with these false prophets. I'm going to take them on. And so Uh, He gets the 450 false prophets of Baal together. He says, hey, how about we have a God challenge? And they were up for it. Yeah, let's have a God challenge. What do you want to do? Well, let's figure out who's the one true God. And here's how we're going to figure it out. Let's both build an altar. Let's cut up a bull. Let's put the bull on the altar and let's see which bull uh, gets barbecued first. Let's see whose God will drain down fire on the altar and burn up the bull. And so it's basically this backyard barbecue, barbecue uh, brawl. That's what I'm, I'm seeing in scripture, right? And so, uh, so Elijah says, hey, you guys go first. And the prophets of Baal, the 450 of them are like, great, that sounds amazing. So they build this altar of wood, they cut up a bull, they put it onto the altar and they start praying to Baal, who is a false God. He doesn't exist. And so nothing happened when they prayed. And so they prayed louder, it says, and, and no one was paying attention because no one was there. And so they start dancing, trying to get the attention of their God and their God doesn't exist. So no one responded. And now Elijah's sitting on the other side saying, man, this is embarrassing. And he starts making fun of them. He's like, hey, maybe, maybe your God's hard of hearing. Maybe you should just pray louder. Maybe you should dance a little more crazy. And maybe your God uh, is on the other line with, another, uh, with other prophets. Or, or maybe he ate Mexican last night and he is a little bit preoccupied this morning. He just starts making fun of them. And these prophets are so angry that they start slashing themselves and cutting themselves, trying to earn the attention of their God that doesn't exist. And Elijah finally had enough. He was embarrassed for them. He was frustrated with them. So he says, you guys just stop what you're doing. It's not working. Come and see me and my God. So he builds an altar of wood. He cuts up the bull. He puts the bull on, his, on this altar to God. And just to make sure that this was not a fluke accident, he takes a jug of water and he pours it all over the bull and all over the altar to soak the wood. And the false prophet said, hey, that's good. How about you do it again? 
And so he says, sure. And so he gets another jug of water and he pours the water on the altar. And so the, the wood starts to soak up the water. And they're like, hey, that's, that's good. How about you try it again? And so he does it again. He soaks the wood, soaks the bull. Everything is sopping wet. And they said, how about you dig a trench and fill the trench with water? And so everything is now covered, immersed in water. There would be no fluke accident if this thing were to catch fire. And then as soon as Elijah prays, whoo, barbecue. And the false prophets in that moment, when they saw the fire, they ran because they knew that Elijah's God was the one true God. And Elijah hunted every one of those guys down and took them out. He became a national hero in one moment. In the same chapter, he then goes up onto a mountain and it hasn't rained for years. And then he asks God to bring rain and then it rains. And in the same chapter, King Ahab then gets in a chariot and starts riding all the way back to a place called Jezreel, which is 15 miles away from where they were. And Elijah gets off the mountain and outpaces the chariot for 15 miles and makes it to Jezreel first. Call it a mountaintop experience. This dude was crushing it. Next chapter, 1 Kings chapter 19. Now Ahab, who was the bad king, told Jezebel, who was the bad wife, everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow... I do not make your life like one of them. And so Elijah, who just got off of this incredible spiritual high, now gets a, a message from a messenger from this woman who gives and offers an empty threat. And if you're a part of Elijah's crew, you're thinking, yeah, Elijah, go get her. Like, go take her down too. Elijah, 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 Elijah says verse three, what happened to Elijah? Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. What? Verse four, and then when he, or continuing on, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush. He sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. So here you have Elijah and he now is running for the Southern border. He tells his servant to stay there. He's about to leave the country. He's about to leave his job behind. He's had enough. So how do you go from this incredible mountaintop experience where you are unstoppable to this place where you're now in a valley And you're so broken that you just want to die. How how do you get there? How did Elijah get there? Well, maybe it's because he was human. Just like you and just like me. And if he were to sit down on a couch and talk to a counselor about what he's experiencing, the counselor would likely say, what you're experiencing, Elijah, is burnout. You're running on empty, overwhelmed, There might be depression, but we need to work on that burnout. Here's the amazing thing about God that you're gonna find in the rest of the story is that he does not give up on Elijah. He doesn't say, all right, well, Elijah's done with, so I'm gonna go find a new prophet. No, he pursues Elijah. He cares for Elijah. And here's what I want you to know today. If you hear nothing else is that God, he loves you. He loves you so much. He loves you right where you are. He wants to meet you right where you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay where you are. I wanna say that again, because that's, that's good news, is that God will meet you right where you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay where you are. I mean, this is the whole point of the gospel where 2000 years ago, God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to come and live for us and then die uh, for us. 
so that he can forgive us of our, our sins and bring us from death to life. He's gonna meet us, yes, in our sin and in our brokenness, but he never wants to leave us there. He always wants to move us to something better. He wants to move us from death and into life, from broken into healing. And the same was true for Elijah. God, he was gonna meet Elijah where he was, but he loved him too much to let him stay where he was. God has a solution when we run on empty and we're gonna see the rest of the story. And I wanna offer this same solution to you. The first thing God does when we deal with burnout, when we're running on empty, is God's going to, he wants to invite us into rest. God invites us into rest. Rest is actually built into the very fabric of creation where on the seventh day, God rested, not because he was tired, but to model for us that in the fabric of our souls, we need rest. So Elijah was on a mountaintop. Now he says, I've had enough. I'm just done with, I just wanna die. I don't even wanna see tomorrow. I want you to see how God tenderly takes care of this man, Elijah. First Kings chapter 19, verse five says, then Elijah laid down under a bush and fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And so he ate and he drank and then he was able to lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back to him a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. And so he got up and he ate and he drank and strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night. So God saw that Elijah was completely out of gas and rather than trying to have a face-to-face, -face, rather than trying to get him just to go back to his job, God knew what this guy needed the most was rest. God understood that this guy was running on empty. And sometimes the best thing for us when we're running on empty is a good night's rest and a good meal. Good night's rest and a, and a good meal. And the same solution truly applies to every single one of us today. When we're feeling burned out, when we're feeling at the end of our rope, when we're completely overwhelmed and exhausted, sometimes the most spiritual thing that we can do is get some rest. Take a break, eat some good food and let God begin to restore us to health. You know, oftentimes our, our lives look a lot like a matchbox where we take out our match every single day and we, we strike that match and we go as hard as we can every single day, every single day. And this match will burn and burn and burn until it burns out. And then we'll take another match and we'll do the same thing over and over again. But one day, one day, this matchbox is gonna run out of matches. And here's what rest looks like for God. And here's what God is inviting us into is that yes, let's strike our match, but there are, there's a day each week that we ought to take time and find rest. Allow God to take on our troubles and our worries. You know, Psalm 46 verse 10, the psalmist says that we should be still and know that I am God, he says. Be still and know that I'm God. To be still literally means take your hands off, let go, relax. Some of us, you need to hear this today. It's okay to take your hands off of everything. You're not designed to be the master of everything in life, God is. So in the fabric of creation, he says, hey, at least one day a week, you need to find rest. But I'd even encourage you each, each and every single day that we should take Sabbath moments where we allow God to give us rest. Sometimes the best thing that we can do is get some rest, eat a good meal and let God be God and recognize that we are not. God, he invites us into rest, but he doesn't stop there with Elijah. He then invites him into reality. 
He invites him into reality. So now we find Elijah, he is in a cave. And he starts complaining to God about his situation. He says, God, you know what? I'm the only one who loves you now. And everyone's out there wanting to kill me. And that's actually not true. That was not reality. As a matter of fact, there were many people who were following God. And there's only one really bitter woman who wanted to kill you, bro. And so God says, okay, here's what I got to do. I have to get his attention I want to speak reality into his life. And so God, he gets him from the cave. He puts him up on a mountain so that he can speak to him. And so he could take away all the distractions. And so the Bible says then when he was on the mountain, this great wind came over the mountain, but God was not in the wind. And then the earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And this fire enveloped the mountain, but God was not in the fire. But then a gentle whisper came. And God spoke to Elijah. You see, sometimes we just have to get rid of all the distractions and all the noise and all the lies so that we can hear the whispers of God so that he can speak reality into our lives. And here was God's message to Elijah. In verse 18, God says, look, I want you to know what you're thinking is not reality. You see, I've reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. God was giving him reality and he wanted to get so close that he could hear the whisper of God. Proverbs 30 verse five says, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And so here's, here's what I want you to know. When we... Uh, open up this, this book, when we open up the Bible and we allow God to speak into our lives, his, his word is flawless. It's pure. It's reality. It's reality. And it will act as a shield from all the lies and all the distractions that come our way, telling us who we are and what we should do. It's a shield that we can then take refuge in him. So here's what I want you to know today is that right now you have a choice by what you're overwhelmed by. You can be overwhelmed by the stuff of life, by the current situation, or, or, or. You can be overwhelmed by the promises of God, by the word of God. God, he invites us into rest when running on empty. He invites us into reality to hear from him every single day. And last, he invites us into relationships. So here we have Elijah. He's exhausted, burned out, depressed. And worst of all, he's isolated. He feels like he's the only person on the planet who loves God. That's a hard place to be. It was only making the situation worse. You know, sometimes we think we're at our best when we're alone, but we're actually the most vulnerable, the most defenseless when we're on our own. So here Elijah is feeling like he's the loneliest person on the planet. And God knew that for him to be fully replenished, he needed relationships. And so here at the end of the story, the Lord said, here's what I want you to do, Elijah. I want you to go back the way you came. Go back to your destiny. Go back to uh, your job. Go back to your plan and the purpose that I have for you. And when you go back into that, I want you to find someone. I want you to find this dude named Elisha. And I want you to anoint him. And he's going to join you in on the mission. And Elisha proved to be that person in Elijah's life that was going to be his confidant, his friend, his partner in ministry, someone he could do life with to help him get through the journey till the end. Here's what I want you to know today is that life is not meant to be lived alone. We're supposed to do life together. Some of us, we're trying right now in our exhaustion and being overwhelmed and burned out. We're trying to isolate ourselves. We're trying to cut away from people. And that's really the sign that we need to press in to people. And here's what I want you to know about Fishhawk Fellowship Church is that I really believe that this is a church that is God's promise that you don't have to do life 
on your own. I had asked you to lean in. Even during this strange time, I'd ask you to lean in to relationships, lean in to a life group, lean in to the people around you. And look, I know we're not perfect. I know that we're gonna be a hot mess. I know that it's gonna be inconvenient sometimes to be the church and do church and love people and serve people. But I want you to just think about it for a second. Jesus, the perfect son of God, the one who created everything, when he came to this earth 2,000 years ago, in the darkest moments of his life, he knew he needed friends. He knew he needed people. And if Jesus, the son of God, had that need for relationship, how much more do we need each other? I need you. And you need me. And we need each other. God, he invites us into rest. He invites us into reality. He invites us into relationships to get us back standing on our own two feet. And what's beautiful is that what you'd find as you read the rest of Elijah's life is that he followed God. Now, does that mean he never worried again? He never got depressed again? He never burned out again? No, he probably did. But here's something really good to know is that his obedience was not based on his current feelings. It was always based on the promises of God. Today, let your journey not be based on your current situation. Let it be based on the promises of God. Think about his future and his plan and his purposes for your life and follow him into that. And if none of this makes sense, maybe all you need is to go take a nap, have a good snack. We'll see you back next week. Let me pray for you. So God, I pray for our church and pray for those listening, God, that might feel they're at the end of themselves. They feel like they've got nothing left to give. They'd say, I've had enough. Lord, today I pray that you give them a breath. Let them understand that if they take a break, the world will not disintegrate. Help them understand that it's okay to be still, that you are God and that we are not. Help us rest this week. Help us tune in to your reality by opening up your word. And God, give us relationships to help us on the journey ahead. Father, if there's any here that don't know you, have never crossed that line of faith, I pray that today they would say yes to you. If you know you need forgiveness, I want you to know God loves you right where you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay where you are. That's why he sent Jesus to die for your sin and to give you life. And so today, if you want life, if you want to begin that journey of faith, you can start just by saying, God, today I give my life to you. I give my life to you. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you made a decision for Christ, there's a, a, a little button uh, that says, uh, hey, salvation. And you can, you can click that button and learn more about next steps here at Fishhawk Fellowship Church. I also want to end our time with our take home. And so here's how we can make this sermon come to life into our week this week. This week, I'm going to start a technology timeout once per week so that I can truly unplug and find rest. Shut it all down. I have Zoom fatigue. I don't know about you, but I need to shut technology down so I can have life. This week, I'm going to help a family member or a friend have time to rest. Maybe you're a husband and you see how your wife has been crushing it. And maybe the best thing that you can do this week is give her a chance to find real rest. And this week, I'm going to contemplate and maybe even memorize Matthew 11:28 28 through 30, which is Jesus' invitation. Come, all you who are weary, so that you may find rest. God bless. Today on this Mother's Day weekend, uh, we get to celebrate uh, this day 
with dedication. Now, if you've never seen dedication done in a church, maybe you have seen a christening or baby baptism. We really believe baptism is reserved for those who have trusted in Jesus with their life. And here, what we see uh, in scripture it, uh, is just a long history of dedications. We see it in the Old Testament with uh, someone like Hannah, who uh, prayed for a son uh, for so long and then Finally, the Lord gave her a son and she named him Samuel. And we see in scripture how she goes and dedicates Samuel to the Lord. Uh, and then we see in the New Testament, even Mary and Joseph go and they dedicate Jesus at the temple back to the Lord. And what dedication is, is really a declaration from parents to say, uh, this, ch this child, these children really aren't ours. They, they really belong to you, God. And we want to honor and serve you by giving our kids back to you. So back in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four through seven, uh, Moses, he's talking to this generation of followers of God, they're about to go into the promised land. And he, he tells them this, Deuteronomy chapter six, hero Israel, the Lord, our God is one. And you should love the Lord, your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. And then he says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And so what Moses is telling parents is that you should love God with every fiber of your being and help your children do the same. This is what dedication really looks like. And today, I'm so excited to have different families sharing that declaration today. So today we have three families uh, that we get to dedicate before the Lord and our church. And the first family we have today is the Burt family. We have got Doug and Jessica and their beautiful kids. Jackson, what's up, buddy? Um, very good. Very good, very good. And we got Ansley. And Jackson is five years old. That's exciting. Ansley's two years old. Jackson, his life verse comes from Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Moses says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you and he will not leave you or forsake you. And that's a beautiful promise, man. I believe you're gonna be strong and courageous. Super, super strong. I love it. And then Ansley, that's right. Ansley is talking so much. Hey, sweetie. So Ansley is such a, a gift to this family. Um, when, when Jessica was 16 weeks pregnant with Ansley, uh, uh, they came across an unexpected loss where Doug lost his, his mom. But what a blessing you have in Ansley. What a gift she is. And appropriately, uh, her life verse comes from Isaiah chapter 60, verse one. And here's her life verse. Arise, shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And what a, what a light she is for your family, even in dark moments. And so you have such a, a beautiful family. What a blessing it is. And like we had already talked about before, uh, really your calling as parents now is to uh, love God with all that you have and help your kids do the same. So your commitment today, is it your commitment to love God with every fiber of your being and help your kids do the same. We do. Amen. Amen. And so the next family that we have today uh, is the Williams family. We have Brian and Claudia and their beautiful daughter, Ellie. Ellie uh, Victoria Williams. Hey, sweetie, how are you? Good. You're good? Yeah. Hey, Ellie, how old are you? Five. You're five? Five? No, four. You're four years old, four years old. What's amazing about this little girl mm -hmm. is I heard last Father's Day, she was already praying to receive Jesus into her heart. So it's clear that you all love the Lord and that Ellie loves the Lord. And I love your life verse. It comes from Jeremiah 29, 11. And here's what Jeremiah says. And here's what God says. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So 
we, we pray that over you, little Ellie, and we're so thankful for the Williams family. And just like we talked about earlier, that this is really a declaration that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then teach Ellie to do the same. So is it your commitment, is it your promise to love God with every fiber of your being and help Ellie do the same? Yes, we will. So the last family that we have here today is the Bauer family. I'm so thankful for to have Danny and Rachel Bauer with us and their beautiful kids, Silas and Mackenzie. And Silas, how old are you, buddy? You're doing great. Hey, how old are you? How old? How, how old? You three? No. No? Okay, I think he's somewhere around three years old or so. And then, and then Mackenzie is five months old. Hi, Mackenzie. You're so beautiful too. So Silas, he is a, a miracle kid. He was born premature. He spent 43 days in a hospital on a ventilator at one point. And now you can see he is healthy and strong. And wow, does he look good today. He's wearing his his. Sunday's best for Jesus today. And then Mackenzie, five months old. For Silas, his life verse comes from Hebrews 13, six. And I love this verse. Hebrews 13, six says, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear for what can man do to me? That's a beautiful verse. And then for Mackenzie Joy, uh, her life verse, it's one of my favorites, comes from 1 Timothy chapter four, verse 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but instead set an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And I know she will in the days ahead. And so like we had talked about previously, uh, really your commitment is about loving God with everything you have and helping your kids do the same. So today, is it your commitment? Is it your promise to love God with every fiber of your being and help your kids do the same? We do. Amen. Amen. Well, let me pray for you and then we'll be done. So Father, I just thank you so much for the Bauer family. God, thank you for the miracle of these children. And I just pray uh, for these children today that, um, that they would really make a commitment to follow you all the days of their life. And Lord, I pray that in the future that these children will be world changers for Jesus that their faith would not be just their parents, but it would be their own. And Lord, I pray for that day to come very soon. And I pray that in the future, that they'd be strong and courageous followers of Jesus. Thank you, God, for these families. And thank you for this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And amen. amen. Thanks again for listening and happy Mother's Day and happy Mother's Day to Thank my you. lovely wife. I love you so much. Thank you. We just want to wish everyone, all the women out there, just happy Mother's Day. We know that Mother's Day can sometimes be a reminder of loss and longing. And we just want you to know that we're with you, we see you, and most importantly, Jesus sees you, and we love you. And so happy Mother's Day. Have a wonderful day today, and let's pray. Yeah. Okay. Dear God, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for just this time that we are alive, God, even though we, there's so much stress and um, uncertainty, God. We know that you are with us, that you are for us, Father. Um, I pray that we would rest in your promises, Lord. Um, I pray for every mother listening, God, that she would know, Father, that her true worth and her true identity is in you, Jesus, and you alone. And I pray, God, for those who this day, um, it brings about feelings of loss and feelings of longing. I pray that you would be with each of them, Father, um, that you would remind them, Lord, that you care for them, that you love them, and that you are with them. So we thank you, God. We thank you for creating mothers. Um, we thank you for the gift of life. Um, and we just worship and praise your holy name today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, y'all.